Because uh, we, I know we spoke in detail about for, false memories in another podcast, but it, could you give people a little bit of a background of how our memory works and why we kind of see false memories and how this affects people in a forensic context or in a criminal context? Absolutely. So in a, it, memory has uh, lots of roles in a, in a forensic context. So if you, uh, if you witness a crime being committed, for example, um, you may know that a crime is being committed. It may be really obvious or you may not know at the time that a crime is being committed and you may only realize later on that you've you've witnessed something that you know you may now have some useful information for uh, for the police um and i think there can be a difference between what we might call intentional encoding so knowing you have to pay attention to something because you're seeing something very important and incidental encoding so just going about your daily life and then realizing later on, oh, actually, that was really important. So a lot of research, um, you know, participants in studies will know that they need to remember something for later on. But in real life, that's that's not the case. You won't necessarily always know that. But even so, um, memory isn't a, a camera or a video recorder. It's reconstructive. And so each time you recall an event, and by recall, I mean, um, you're not responding to any particular cue. You're just trying to dredge up what, what you remember. Each time you recall an event, the the account will differ, um, perhaps subtly. So you may forget details over time that perhaps don't seem important, or you may come to incorporate detail over time. Uh, so say, for example, if something happens in an event that you don't quite understand and you can't fit it into a narrative of how that event might have played out. You may come to forget that detail because you can't logically fit it into a story. Or you may um, encounter details from other witnesses that you've spoken to or from media reports, or you may actually just generate other details because they help you to explain some kind of gap in your account. So over time, we find that some details may be forgotten, some details may be incorporated, some things might be emphasised, others might be de-emphasised. But in essence, yeah, every time you recall something, that's a, it's, a, it's a different instance and that memory will be different from the previous time, even if you don't realise it. And that's, that's not because anyone's trying to do anything wrong, it's just because that's how memory works. It, you know, it is, it is reconstructive and we recall... We recall things in chronological order. We recall things as stories because that's how we best remember them. That you know, that's how it makes sense to us. It needs to make a coherent whole. And um, you know, over time, people's memories change as well. As I say, you incorporate new bits of details. You forget things. Um, and so, really, well-meaning eyewitnesses, their accounts may change over time. They may come to include other witnesses' detail. They may come to um, change descriptions of perpetrators. Um, they may come to add details which they didn't actually encounter at the time. You know, and, and that is a false memory. If you include something as part of your account that you didn't actually see, that's a false memory. You may think you remember it, um, but you've just misattributed it to the source. You know, you've, you've attributed it to your memory rather than to coming from another witness. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, it's just, it's just an established fact that our, our memories are very fallible. I mean, they can be absolutely amazing. They can be amazing, but they can be fallible. And even when we know that the, you know, we have to pay attention, this situation's really important. We need to remember this detail and we try and rehearse the detail. Um, it's still fallible, uh, but also our memory for unfamiliar people isn't great. So um, witnesses may know that they're witnessing a crime and they may be looking at the perpetrator and they might think, I need to look really carefully at this person. I need to remember everything about their face because I'm going to need to give a, a description to the police. I might need to take part in a police lineup. So pick the person out of an identity parade or a video identity parade. Um, and even then, we know that we don't necessarily remember the 
um, the characteristics of faces that distinguish them from other faces. So in terms of face processing, um, if you think about how you would describe a face, you might describe um, whether the, the face is a male or female face, whether they have facial hair, what the hairstyle is, skin colour, eye colour, hair colour, any distinctive features. But realistically, the sorts of descriptions we give about faces will apply to probably tens of thousands of faces. And what's actually really important for face recognition is the, is the, um, the distances between the features. So subtle changes in distances between the eyes, for example, can really impact face recognition. But that's not something we ever verbalise. It's not, it's not something we're very good at verbalising. It's not something we're used to doing. And so um, our descriptions of, of faces typically aren't great. Uh, you know, particularly faces we've maybe only seen once. We may have seen them from quite a distance. We may only have seen them for, you know, a few seconds. And we know as well that we have group biases. So um, the most famous of these is the own race bias, whereby we are particularly poor at distinguishing between faces of other races and ethnicities to our own. Um, and there are, there are different reasons for this. It may be kind of an inattentional bias because we tend to group what we think of as outgroup members together, but we individuate um, members of our own in-group. And we do see actually that people who have a lot of quality contact with a range of people from different ethnicities show a lower bias, as in they're much better able to distinguish between um, different people of a different ethnicity to themselves or a different race to themselves. And there's a really famous case in the United States of, of Ronald Cotton and Jennifer Thompson. Um, Jennifer Thompson was at home one night and she was, um, you know, a man broke into her house and he attacked her and she was in bed and it was dark and she was staring at this man saying, you know, thinking to herself, I need to remember him. If I survive this encounter, I'm going to make sure that he goes to prison for what he's done to me. And she did survive the encounter and she went to the police and, you know, she was absolutely certain that she gave him a good description. She picked a guy out of a lineup and, um, you know, was given feedback. Oh, you know, that's, you know, great. You've done really well. And I think later on down the line, she then took part in another lineup. And she picked the same person and the police said, oh, that's great. You know, you picked the same person you picked last time. So by now she's absolutely convinced that she's picked the right man. And in fact, she picked the wrong man. And, and Ronald Cotton went to prison for about 11 years. Um, and while he was in prison, um, the real offender was heard bragging in prison about what he'd done and what he got away with. And it's a really interesting story. Uh, Ronald Cotton was eventually exonerated. Um, and he and Jennifer Thompson actually then travelled around the United States to colleges and universities telling people about their story and what had happened. Um, and, you know, and she was a really well-meaning eyewitness. But what had happened was um, she had, Ronald Cotton was a black man. She was a white woman. We know that these are cases that are particularly poor for wrongful convictions. Um, so African-American men in the States are much more likely to be um, wrongfully convicted, um, particularly if the witness is white. And she, you know, she'd made a, an innocent mistake. Uh, she was absolutely convinced. Ronald Cotton actually does look very similar to the real offender, Bob, Bobby Poole. Um, and, it, you know, it was she had that memory of Ronald Cotton in her mind. And she then had that memory qualified by police officers who said, you picked the same person. Well, what do you think? Well, I picked I picked the right person twice. She then went to court and was, you know, 100 percent certain that she'd picked the right person because she'd picked the same person twice, and then her, her confidence in that identification had been inflated. Um, and so we know that witnesses do that as well. Witnesses' memory in their accounts and witnesses' um, confidence in their memory 
both for events and for people, is inflated if they get external feedback that um, supports their identification or their account. Now, that might be from another witness. It may be from a police officer, maybe from a media report. Um, but a, a confident but mistaken eyewitness is still really compelling to a jury. And they may persuade the jury that they are absolutely, you know, 100% certain. And, and they may be 100% certain, but they can they can be very inaccurate. And um, we know that mistaken eyewitnesses are involved in, I think the US Innocence Project statistics have it at around 75% of cases, 75% of miscarriages of justice that they have been involved in, involve wow. a mistaken eyewitness. Uh, there may be other factors as well, um, but a mistaken eyewitness is, in, is involved in the vast majority of cases. And these are just well-meaning people that are trying to help the police to, to solve a crime. There's nothing untoward or sinister about their motivations. 